morning. What a what a beautiful looking group this morning. My gosh. I'm thrilled to be here for a lot of reasons. And Pam, what a great introduction to the two days. Pam touched on something that I just wanted before I get into this that is so important. You know, all one has to do is listen to the news. And you see and hear what our kids are seeing and hearing. And it's all around them, whether they're white, black, or brown. And sometimes school is the only safe place. And how do we learn together to get through this? Pam, thank you for mentioning that. That is something, as we get down into the issues at hand, we remember here, you're here for all kids. And yes, you got some wonderful folks here as speakers, and we'll chat a little bit more about that. And Denise, I'm starting my timer here. They, we're gonna try to stay on topic here because you got a lot of folks following. Um, but I wish you guys could see yourselves from up here. Because the, I'm always accused of being the hopeless optimist. <laughs> especially when I'm in that building across the street over there. You know, there's a lot of people that want to talk about that we're on our decline, and in particular that schools are on a decline, and I just don't buy it. I don't believe it. And I look at you guys here, and the, the folks that have come to this conference, and we absolutely know we're on the rise. I had a great chance to sit with a good friend Tara Vandiver from Wayne Township. And of course I didn't recognize her because she had her hair all up and, and so I had to reintroduce myself and then I felt embarrassed. But that happens a lot to me. But she was talking about celebrating last night the achievement of their kids with an award ceremony. And that is so important for each and every of us. Because I would, I would challenge you that you are going to hear some wonderful heroes and leaders in our field. But I would ask you to look across the table right now. Because the real heroes and champions are sitting with you at your table. Now what do I mean by that? There's a new book. New book out, Nick Kristoff, writes for the New York Times, wrote a book with his wife, Shirley Wudan, and it's stories about people who made a difference. And these aren't people at high levels of government. They aren't people that are at the top of society. They're people that made a difference. And he starts off by talking about a man who was escaping from Russia back in the 1920s, and he had to get permission to leave. And there was a clerk, there was a clerk that stayed just a bit later to process his father's application to get out of Russia. The next day, nobody could leave. If that clerk hadn't processed one piece of paper that allowed him to leave, he wouldn't have gotten to this country, wouldn't have met his mother, and Nick Kristoff, who's an amazing writer for the Times, that has been to Darfur, he's been arrested, he has documented struggles all around the world, would have never been born. So as we talk a little bit this morning, you have those opportunities every day. And you're going to learn lots of tools over the next two days. But sometimes it's that little bit extra that you do, and I'm sure you do it, because you're here, that makes a difference. It makes you so important. You know, I started off in life to be a teacher. I often tell legislators I never claim to be the smartest person in the room. I went to college to play football. Little tiny school. I came down to two choices. Both were going to give me scholarships. One was a winning program, one was a losing program. One would have cost me nothing to go to school, and the other one was $500, which seems pretty trivial today. But I grew up on a small town in South Dakota in the middle of a reservation, and that $500 was life-changing. So I went to the losing program. Had a great time, even though if you watch me walk up here, I now have knees that have to be replaced from playing football. And somebody asked me, you know, well, was that all worth it? 
I said, that's where I met the folks 42 years ago that steered me to the art. Because when I graduated, there were a lot, of, a lot of openings for social studies teachers. Anybody in here set out to teach social studies, coach football? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> we, got, we both got waylaid along the way. Well, in 1973, I was graduating from college and there were no teaching openings. And one of the coaches was the first college professor in South Dakota in this little tiny school that took an interest in special education in 1968. And in 1973, he said, why don't you talk to these people that work for the ARC? They're looking for somebody. They don't have much money, that remains true today, but they want somebody to travel the state and talk about what we can do with kids. 42 years later, it's all I've done is work with the ARC. And I know there are many in this room that are younger, that weren't even born when we got started. <laughs> Pam mentioned 94-142, my first day on the job in July of 1973, my boss took me to a meeting and we were writing the first rules for mandatory special education that would be put in place two years hence. Now imagine you're starting with a clean sheet of paper and you wrote the rules. Nobody had done it before. That isn't that long ago that we said all kids could go to school. And now we have wonderful things happening that you are part of. I love the story Pam told of the person that changed the dynamic on how folks look at individuals. And that happens every day. A young man named Cameron. Cameron graduated from Snyder High School in Fort Wayne. Anybody here from Snyder? Fort Wayne? Okay. Cameron is a young man, happens to have Down syndrome, wants to be a music therapist. <coughs> Loves music. I would not bet against him finding a career in music. And you know where he got his first intern internship now? He got it through a company, Sweetwater Sound. One of the biggest music companies in America is in Fort Wayne, Indiana. They have top stars come through all the time. He is finding that dream of where he wants to go. He wouldn't have gotten there without a school and folks through the adult side, helping him find his path on that. And sometimes it's that one person that believes in you along the way. That one person that says, what can I do to make this change happen? He's got a good friend that's out with him in Sweetwater and I was sitting talking to him. They both happened to be really into music and he had his headphones on and a cap on backwards. Young kid. And I was talking this summer, because they were doing a special program at Indiana, Purdue, Fort Wayne, in the summer program. And he had this music blaring, and he had two cell phones going. And here's this 19-year-old kid with Down syndrome. And I said, hey, what, what you listening to? Rap. I said, well, who do you like? And he said, Chris Brown. Now, I mean, if you want to battle all the stereotypes, here's a 19-year-old white kid who happens to have Down syndrome listening to rap music. Talk about blending cultures there. And isn't that okay as we start thinking about it and where their futures want to be? We allow people to start dreaming about what they can do. Now, when I was in school, it was a very different world that we lived in. And before I offend anybody, are there any school psychologists in the room? I just like to know if I'm going to get hit later. <laughs> <clears throat> we had a traveling school psychologist, very small BIA school that I went to. So we didn't have a full-time school psychologist. And this kid came out one time, and he was looking at this, my friend Billy. Billy was a native kid, and Billy was a good kid, but he had been labeled as a child with challenges. Again, this would have been in the 60s before we had all the rules that we had. But Billy got to come to school. It's a BIA school. And the psychologist came in and had tested him the year before, came back the next year and was testing him again. And again, it was a small school. So to test him, they took Billy out 
to the car and administered the test in his car. Because we had to have privacy, of course. <laughs> Came back in and Billy was doing really well in school and I thought Billy was was great kid. I mean, we didn't have separate classes. We were all in one room. Three different grades all in one room. And the psychologist came in and started berating the teacher. It was a wonderful teacher. I still remember my, my teacher there, Mrs. Jones. What have you done to this kid, Mrs. Jones? What have you done to him? He's regressed tremendously. And she said, I don't understand. He does so well in school. He said he wouldn't answer a single one of my questions. He is withdrawn among himself. I think he has severe behavioral problems. We may have to send him away to what we then had as a, a special school for kids who are Native American. We may have to send him away. And she said, no, 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 we aren't going to do that. What happened? She said, I don't know. I've got to write a report. She pulled Billy, Billy aside and started talking to him. And, and she looked at him and said, Billy, what happened out in the car? And he said, I am so sorry. And she said, what do you mean? What happened? He said, well, this man showed me all these pictures again. And the same pictures he showed me last year. And I told him what they were last year. And he's now asking me again. And I felt sorry for him. So I didn't want to embarrass him. <laughs> so when he showed me an apple, I thought, I told you last year what it was. You, don't, you still don't know. <laughs> and so he said, I, I just didn't want to embarrass him. <laughs> I only tell that story because of the perspective that we look at things. And how do we look at people? How many of you got caught up in the, was it white or gold, black or blue dress thing? <laughs> I think whoever did that amazing lesson for us on perspective, we can all see the same thing and see two different things. And we can all see exactly the same kid and see two different things. I meet periodically with a group of kids who are now coming out of school. Some of them are out of school. They meet for coffee down at a coffee shop in Fountain Square. If you ever around Saturday afternoons at 1 o'clock, just drop by and kind of listen in. It is the most amazing discussion of young people labeled with the title autism on them. And they're just wonderful kids. Wonderful kids and young adults. One of them wants to be a teacher. And he said, you know why I want to be a teacher? I want to infiltrate the system. <laughs> I loved it. So they invited me every now and then. I come in and I get to listen because they want to do a movie. They want to do a movie to tell teachers what it's like to be a child with autism in their class. Now we're, we're and again, it's, it's, it's kind of like a herd of cats. I mean, it's, I don't try to control anything. I just love being part of the experience. And you know what they call themselves? They call themselves Aspies. <laughs> we would never do that, but it's how they look at it. So they're talking about how they could explain to you as teachers what it's like to be a student with autism. And the one guy, his name's Isaac, but they call him Wiki um, for Wikipedia. Because you ask him a question, my God, he's got it. And he goes on for, he's beautiful. But you know, they're sitting there talking and they said, if there's one thing we could tell people, it's that we're all unique and different. We're all different. And he said, it's not like a spectrum, like a line. You know, we often talk about a spectrum like an arc or a line. He said, it's like that color picker on Photoshop. I'm not red. I am this particular shade of red today. Now, I might be different tomorrow. And they said, the number one thing, and I want to share this with you, they said, is, it's all about we're all different. One of the guys says, the other thing I tell teachers is we're not crazy. And one of the other guys says, well, we are a little crazy, but we're not dangerous. <laughs> and I said, I fit that degree, too. <laughs> so as you start thinking about this, this whole issue of perspective, and you can be this amazing champion as we start listening and learning a little bit. Well, we started taking on some new ideas. And one of them is, is what happens after school? You get kids ready for this adventure we call life. And we had a lot of families talking to us about what comes afterwards. We've got experiments in post-secondary. But we also have this idea of how can I have a career? 
It's a young man in Albuquerque, New Mexico that's opened his own restaurant. He has to have Down syndrome. I went to look at it, it was on vacation. He runs that restaurant. He's in the sixth grade, he said, I want to have a restaurant. If you're ever in Albuquerque, it's called Tim's Place. It's amazing. If you Google him, you'll find a video about him. It is just amazing. Now, does that mean everybody with Down syndrome is going to start a restaurant? No. But he wanted to run the place. I'm sitting there having breakfast. I didn't know him, didn't uh, announce myself to anybody. And he walks up to my friend and I and says, how's Melissa doing for you today? I just hired her yesterday. I haven't decided whether I'm keeping her or not. <laughs> This man's 24 years old. And then he pats Melissa on the back and said, just kidding, Melissa, and he's winking at me all the time. <laughs> he's the perfect maitre d'. His brother handles the cooking. They have an accountant to do the books. But it is Tim's place. So we started thinking, how can we break some boundaries of that? And how can we take advantage of some of the growing market? So we are, through the arcs, doing something that's never been done before. This fall, we will open a 150-room courtyard by Marriott in Muncie, Indiana, connected to the convention center, that will have the country's first ever training institute embedded in the hotel, where individuals will come for four to eight weeks, learn a specific set of skills around a career choice they want. They'll live in the hotel. They'll be part of that environment. They'll work and get paid in the hotel for the area of expertise they want to develop. And we're partnering with Ball State and IU Ball Memorial Health, a hospital there, and looking at how do we develop careers for folks that want to come back with a work credential that will have the name of the Marriott on it, Pots and Pans Productions. Go visit Scotty's Brew House while you're in town here. He's the partner with us that's going to run our, our restaurant. And the credential has been agreed to by the Indiana Hospitality and Restaurant Association. So will your students, if this is an area that they want to explore, will be able to live, work in the hotel, and come back with a credential that starts them on a career path where they can come to work in a fine hotel like this at whatever area they want. And it's going to be open to all persons with disabilities. And I think Jeannie Sheets is here. Jeannie, there you go, stand up. Jeannie Sheets is our Director of Outreach for the Training Institute, a wonderful lady that just joined us in, in December. If you have any questions, you can reach her while she's here. But the idea is, how do we change the dynamic around it? One of the things we also do, our hotel is a for-profit corporation. We want to pay taxes. It drove our accountants nuts. They said, why are you doing this? You don't have to pay property taxes. You don't have to pay income taxes on the hotel. Why are you doing this? We said, because other children and adults depend on tax revenue to support them in what they do. And we want to show that we can still be a business, makes money, 20% of the people that work in the hotel are going to be individuals with disabilities, and it is a thriving business model. Marriott came to us and said, we want to start bringing our hotel managers to see what you're doing. So we are going to be bringing HR people throughout the hotel all year long, training them about how we create career path opportunities for folks. We've been pleased that the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation is interested. A number of foundations have said, we want to find a way to support people. And we will pay scholarships for folks to pay their tuition while they're there. So opening up a whole new avenue. Is it right for everybody? Absolutely not. But what we want to do is change the thinking and allow people to dream about this. Ran into a mom just purely by happenstance. And she was talking to me. Um, she's in Brownsburg. Anybody here from Brownsburg? Great, great. Uh, she has an 11-year-old son. She read about the hotel. And he told her, he said, I'd love to work in a hotel. They're practicing now. It's gotten him to start folding clothes. How do we change our thinking about where we're going? School isn't just a place to go to for 12 years. It's leading you to what's next. It's what you believe in or you wouldn't be here. I want to just end with a couple of quick things. 
It is so important that you realize the power that you have. A few years ago, a study was done and they asked families, 20,000 families around the country, actually I'm old now so it's probably 25 years old, the, the question was what makes a great special education program? And they interviewed people and the responses were all across the map but one stood out over everything else. What do you think it was? Anybody, throw it out, just shout it out. What do you think the number one response is? This isn't a test, it isn't gonna be written down, and it will be not used in your school evaluation report. So, <laughs> what do you think the number one thing they said was? You ma'am, what do you think they said? Yep, I'm pointing at you, right there. Any ideas? Young lady with the gray, gray suit on. Yeah, see, she's proving the fact, don't ever sit close, right? Sit way in the back. Pam, what do you think the number one thing in the survey was? Teachers who care, and I did not plant that with her. There was somebody in their school that cared about their child. It wasn't about a fancy IEP. It wasn't about technology or instructional modalities. All of that's essential in Portman. But they believed somebody cared about them. Now think back to your last case conference you sat through. How do you extend that caring to people? When we've got all these rules we have to follow, all of the discussions we've got to do, how do we make sure that caring comes across? There's no magic way to do it. But if you want the families on your side, and I spend much of my life talking to families, and there's great successes out there. But if you're sincere and you care about them, it isn't going to be this adversarial relationship. It'll be a partnership of how do we work together. Because we all want the same things. And think about it. We sit down with that family. Many of them we know. Sometimes we don't know them that well. Sometimes they don't know all the team around there. If I asked you right now and said, this is your team, this is your case conference, spill your guts, tell them everything you want out of your career, your life, your marriage, your relationships, your family, and in the next 15 minutes, we'll write to the next one, we'll move around the table. We wouldn't get very far. So it's all about building relationships. They want somebody that cares. They want somebody that believes there's a future for their son or daughter. And that's where we'll get to this better place. Last thing I want to share with you. We are in this together. Families, educators, public school officials. Sometimes it seems like we're more at war with each other than we are with the forces against us. And there are a lot of people that want to <coughs> consider public education as just another provider of service in the community. If you go back and you read Kai Erickson or Eric Erickson, sociologist, and they talk about a New England village the first hundred years. Do you know why we did public education in this country? To teach a new nation how to live together. And I thought of this when Pam was talking. We're not only preparing kids for a life after school, we're preparing kids for a community. And how do we build community? We're working on a project on bullying. And just to share one thought on this. The patterns around bullying start very young. So by the third grade, it's determined pretty much, some of the research is saying, whether you're a bystander, you're a bully, or you're gonna be a victim. And how do we change that dynamic that kids feel good about each other, good about in school. We've got to figure that out. And we figure that out together. We're going to figure out funding together. We've got this idea that we give schools less. You're going to do more. It doesn't work that way. We've done that. Tried it. Doesn't work. We've got to find a way to build that together. And I'm talking to, again, a little bit of the choir as we look at this. And my, the, the thing I would ask you is, last election we had, and I'm not going to talk politics, Democrat, Republican, Independent. I'm going to talk about voting. I want adults with disabilities to vote. I want you to vote. I want their parents to vote. 27% of Hoosiers participated in the last election that we had. 27%. So are the, is, 
everybody on this end of the room willing to let these two rows at the end decide what happens? That's what we did in this last election. We have to be mobilized as people that are concerned about where we're going. And again, I'm not saying which party you support or who you support. Find somebody you like and support them and tell other people to do it too. Because we're not giving up. We're not going away. We need better public schools. But we have great schools right now. We have successes to celebrate. We have people like you and leaders like Pam and Tara and so many here ready to step up and help celebrate and lead us into success. We'll get there. We thank you for allowing us to be part of this this morning. You are making a difference. And you're going to hear lots of wonderful people. But there's wonderful people sitting in the chair right next to you. Tell them thank you for coming and find out their story because there are amazing things happening in our schools and I thank you for that. Take care. God bless. Have a wonderful two days.